I worked for a district, the Newton, Massachusetts district, is an upper middle class district. They are rather wealthy and they care about minority children. They also have a backbone. Most educational administrators will cave in at the first sign of a problem. But Newton stood up and said, we are spending most of the school day teaching these children the English language so that they can connect with subject matter in English, they can connect with their classmates, and they can avail themselves of educational opportunities. We did that even though the state of Massachusetts withdrew some of our funding and said we were out of compliance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, we finally prevailed, but it, it was not an easy battle. The um, idea that every group in our society, every culture, Every language that people come with must be preserved is part of the multiculturalist ideal. There is also the idea that every culture is equally valid. And one must never be judgmental. One must never say anything critical of any culture. We had, in our district, we had students from Afghanistan, from Iran, from Iraq, from African countries, from Asian countries. Well, they all came together in the English language classroom. They learned English, they graduated from high school, they went on to college, many of them. We did such a good job. But we found problems when, for instance, two young women from Afghanistan who at 15 and 16 were beginning to look ahead to going to an American university. They were doing so well in school. But their families decided now they must go back to Afghanistan to be married. Married off, this was part of their culture. And this was very hard for us not to object, but we, we could not, all we could do was talk to the parents and say, you know, they have a wonderful opportunity here. But in the end, it was their decision to do as they saw fit. Um, the um, diversity bandwagon began in 1978 when a man named Mr. Baki sued because he applied to medical school, his grades were very high, but he was not admitted in favor of students, minority students, with much lower achievement in order to provide for their, um, give them an opportunity in, in order to promote multiculturalism and diversity. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Mr. Baki. They said in 1978, race alone cannot be it cannot be the only deciding factor in university admissions or jobs or anything of that sort. But Justice Sandra O'Connor added a piece to that decision. And she said, but there is a benefit in creating diverse populations at universities or in companies, etc. Well, since 1978, the diversity bandwagon has been enormous. That it is said that we want, we have a goal. The goal is to have every group represented in our school, in our company, in our etc. But in fact, it's a matter of quotas because university admissions people look at what percentage of our student body is African American, what percentage is Hispanic, what percentage is Asian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they really, they work very hard at trying to maintain an equal balance. In the job area, it's 
it's really very, very hard because not every person in every group wants to be in every occupation. For instance, should firefighters be 53% female because females make up 53% of the country? Should police? Should the military? When you start parceling out, creating these blocks, these separate blocks, you hurt the unity of the country. And what are the costs of these wonderful ideals? Voting ballots in two languages create a cost for cities, a very high cost. In the first few decades, in the first few years that voting ballots began to be produced in more than one language, it turned out, in many cases, these ballots were not used. Traditionally, new citizens who come to vote, if, they, if their English is not quite good enough to understand it, they bring someone with them. Polling places allow a helper. In Hawaii, the first time they provided ballots in two languages, they spent $40,000 for the preparation of the information in advance of the voting, and they found two people picked up that information. On voting on election day, they had the ballots translated into two languages, and two people picked that up. That was another 40000 It may even have been the same two people. It was ridiculous. There are many, many anecdotes of this type that I cannot, I cannot take up your time with. Um, right, Robert? But, but let me say, in Boston, last year, at election time, it was not enough that the ballots were provided in Chinese, in Mandarin, and English. An activist in the Chinese American community said, well, you have to translate the names of the candidates because the names are only in English and they, have, they must be translated into Chinese characters. Well, when that was done and they were all printed, on election day, they dis somebody discovered that some of the translations of the names were so incorrect that one name was something like man who buys t-shirts <laughs> um, it, was, it was a totally ridiculous thing to do. Well, these are the kinds of things that happen. I'd like to tell you, though, about the one big victory that, that we can point to with pride. The Bilingual Education Act that was passed in Massachusetts was copied by 16 other states. In spite of the fact that Hundreds of research studies were published showing that this education program was not only a failure, it was hurting children. Doesn't matter. Politically correct, it's like mom and apple pie. Every politician said they supported bilingual education. They probably didn't even know what it was. But they loved it. Democrats and Republicans all loved it. Then, in 1998, a group of Mexican-American parents who were sending their kids to school, and year after year, their children were coming home with all their books and schoolwork in Spanish. And some of the parents went to the school and said, hey, when is my kid going to learn English? Oh yes, your child is in a very good program. Well. A, an Episcopal priest, Sister Alice Callahan, <coughs> was working with the parents, and she said, this is ridiculous, this cannot go on. So they organized a boycott of the Ninth Street School, and that got the attention of the national press. It was even featured in the New York Times. A very wealthy millionaire in California businessman named Ron Unz, who himself was of immigrant family, 
took up the cause and he said, we're going to, we're going to have a referendum in this state and we're going to ask the people to vote. And he called this activity English for the children. Well, Ron Unz enlisted my help and a few others to write the language of this referendum. And guess what? Although no Democrat and no Republican supported it, it passed with 62% of the vote, including many immigrants in California. Well, then we went to Arizona in 2000. Same referendum was put before the public. Arizona is a state, as you know, on the Mexican border, a largely uh, Hispanic population. Many, many people in Arizona trace their background to Mexico. Guess what? 64% voted to throw out bilingual and bring English language teaching to the children. A few years later, Ron got in touch with me again, and he said, now we're ready. We're going to have this campaign in Massachusetts. I said, you must be crazy. Massachusetts is the most far left state in the known universe. They'll never vote for it. He said, Rosalie, I think we can do it. Will you be, will you lead this campaign with me? Okay, we did it. Guess what? Massachusetts, 68% of the population voted for this overturn of the law and brought in English language teaching. It was such a triumph. You know, it makes me feel anyone with luck, with help, with media support, can make things change. It doesn't always succeed, but in this case, we did make a big change. That, I'm afraid, I have a message that my time is just about up, but I'm so happy to see this wonderful audience here to hear our message. Thank you.